The East Asian economic miracle is a neoliberal vindication. Adam Smith could say, you see, I was right. That it's a vindication for free market liberals, and indeed, free market liberals claim the East Asian miracle. They argue the reason why Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, and so on grew was because they got the prices right. That they were good students of Adam Smith in economics. And incidentally, the economies that don't do well at that time, places like Vietnam and China and North Korea, are precisely those that are anti-market, communist, state socialist, and so on. And indeed, India prior to 1990. So for these neoliberals, they say, actually, places like Taiwan, Korea, Singapore, and so on got the prices right. First, they leveraged cheap, skilled labor. They did exactly what Adam Smith says you should do. What did these economies have? They had skill, cheap, labor. That was their natural comparative advantage. And they exploited them and exploited this comparative advantage in labor-intensive manufacturing. The government did play a role, but it was a minimal role, according to the neoliberal view. These governments played a very limited role, but an important one by providing, for instance, infrastructure. They didn't go into business or anything like that, but they did provide roads. They did provide electricity grids. They did provide ports. They put on the ground the telecommunications infrastructure and so on. So government did play a role, but it played a very small role. It did exactly what Adam Smith says governments should do which is to put down infrastructure. Yeah, we'll get to that. Right? The question was, did it not also prevent labor mobility? Absolutely. But for now, as far as what the free market liberals wanted to see, they saw lean fiscal governments and governments that essentially just paid for infrastructure. The liberals loved the East Asian economic miracle economies because they had stable foreign exchange rates. They didn't have these interventionist banks that were, you know, the central banks that were intervening all the time and screwing around with currency exchange rates. They had very stable fixed exchange rates that facilitated global economic trade. These were not tax and spend governments. They had very low tax rates. They still do have very low tax rates. They had very low corporate tax rates, and they have extremely low income tax rates. And for free market liberals, of course, this is a good thing. Taxes are a market distortion. By having low tax rates, that's good for investment. You want to get good capitalist investment, you need low tax rates. These economies, unlike China, for instance, in the 1950s and 60s, were open to foreign direct investment. Right? These economies, beginning in the 1950s, said we're open to international business. We want you to come and invest in our economy. We will set up joint ventures with you. We want international capital, and we want to learn how to grow businesses from those who know how to do it, particularly <coughs> from the West. They also got the prices right because they climbed up the export value chain. Well, in a sense, they were very good students of Smith. They had cheap labor, relatively skilled, which meant that they weren't going to make rocket ships, and they weren't going to make cell phones, or they weren't going to make high-tech stuff in the 1960s, but they could make plastic toys. And they could make them well, and they could make them cheap, and they didn't have any grander ambitions than that. So they were perfect students of the Smithian notion of specialization and, um, and uh, global capital. So for these neoliberals, these East Asian economies plugged into the global market and they let the invisible hand of the market rule. There was minimal government intervention. And essentially what we saw was a very much liberal vindication. Adam Smith, by and large, was right. There's also a complementary view, or a counter view, however way you want to put it, 
And that is this notion that, in fact, these economies got the prices wrong. So you can decide if you think it's a counter view, or you can decide if it's a complementary view. But it does ask, or begets the prior question, where did these firms come from? These were agricultural economies in the 1950s. They didn't know how to make anything. Where did these firms come from? And for the mercantilists, they argue that in fact these East Asian economies that fundamentally got the prices wrong. They didn't get the prices right, like the neoliberals think, but in fact they got the prices wrong. And in fact, these governments strategically distorted the market. The key point here is that they provided, these governments provided infant industry protection so that these firms could grow. And that they could eventually grow into globally competitive firms. What we saw here then was a deliberate state-led strategy. This was a government-led strategy. The government, for instance, provided subsidies, interest-free loans. It provided credit. It provided subsidies, for instance. It created incentives. It said, for instance, if you are able to produce product X at this price, then we will give you a tax break. In other words, the government deliberately distorted the market to help protect and encourage the creation of these firms. Now, the government actually even invested in firms. The government actually became an equity shareholder, never a majority, but nonetheless an equity shareholder in private sector firms. They also, as your colleague pointed out, disciplined labor. Yes, this labor was cheap. It was skilled, or relatively skilled, but it was also repressed. In places like Taiwan and Korea, unions were illegal until the 1980s. Collective wage bargaining did not exist until the 1980s. So through government intervention, it distorted the price of labor. It distorted labor markets to make it cheaper. They put up these tariffs. We call it import substitution tariffs. They put up tariffs, which is basically a tax, on precisely those goods that foreign companies made that those countries themselves wanted to make. Let me put it this way. They want to make televisions, right? Korea wants to make televisions. Korea doesn't know how to make televisions. And they're never going to learn how to make television so long as American televisions continue to come into Korean markets. So they created an import substitution tariff. They taxed American television, thereby making American televisions more expensive, which thereby then allowed Korean firms to grow, to learn how to make television. In fact, all of these economies had a very select list. They didn't just put taxes and tariffs on everything. They strategically picked the goods and services that they wanted to tax in those areas that they wanted to develop. In other words, they distorted the market to protect their domestic industries. So the point here is they got the prices wrong. They used the visible hand of the government, in other words, to pick and make winners. These countries created national champions. Let me give you an example. And it's not a sexy example, but it's an important one. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. This is really one of the most exciting things. I've actually, you know, written quite a bit about it. But TSMC was formed in the 1980s. I know it sounds laughable, like what the hell, you know, business case on semiconductor manufacturing. TSMC was formed in the late 1980s. Remember, this is Taiwan, right? Taiwan didn't know how to make a damn thing in the 1950s and 60s. And it creates this firm in the late 1980s called TSMC. 
or to the early 1980s, I'm sorry. By the late 1980s, TSMC controlled 70% of global market share in integrated circuits. It was now beating out every U.S. firm. It was beating out every U.S. firm and every Japanese firm in an extremely competitive and lucrative market. Just so you know, all of the guts of your electronics are based on integrated circuits and semiconductors, and 70% of those are made by this company. So you can imagine how lucrative this company is. The key strength of this company is basically it makes integrated circuits and it designs and manufactures them to specifications. So the question is, how did it do this? How did Taiwan, a basket case economy in the 1950s, become the world's leading producer of the most important internal component of the most lucrative consumer market in the world? First thing it did was it leveraged existing strengths. It knew it couldn't make electronics. Didn't know how to make integrated circuits. That's really high-end stuff. But it did make electronics. It did make toys. It did make electronic stereos and other consumer electronic goods. Couldn't make integrated circuits, but it could do electronics. It was also very good at engineering. Taiwan at that time was not very good at science. It wasn't, it wasn't inventing new things, but it was very good at engineering. It invested a lot of money into engineering, and particularly electrical engineering. In the 1970s, the government set up this thing called ITRI, the Industrial Technology Research Institute. This was a publicly funded R&D lab in which it gathered together the best engineers in Taiwan. It recruited the best of the best in Taiwan by paying them really high salaries. And it also actively recruited overseas Taiwanese from where? Anyone want to guess where they were actively, actively recruited? What's that? Silicon Valley. Each we set up a lab in Silicon Valley in California and said, all you Taiwanese, why don't you come back home? We're going to pay you lots of money. Go back, you'll do something for your home country, awesome apartments, get you a car, anything you need. But we want the best engineers back in Taiwan working at Itri. In the case of TSMC, the government bought the technology. As I say, Taiwanese firms did not know how to make integrated circuits, did not know the first thing about the technology, had good engineers, could make good stereos, could make it through industry. RCA, the American company, says we have the patent here for our semiconductors and we're willing to sell it on the open market. Who wants to buy this technology? Well, normally firms buy it. In this case, no firm in Taiwan knew what to do with it. So the government bought it. The government paid for and licensed in the technology put that technology into E-Tree, and then invested in R&D. Said, we just paid millions of dollars for this technology, we're throwing in this lab, we're paying you the highest salaries, now you do the reverse engineering, you figure out how to make this. And we want you to figure out how to make this cheaper, and of higher quality, and with greater engineering specifications. And these engineers worked on it for about eight years. And they said, we have finally figured it out. We have this great new technology. We've improved the RCA technology. We can do it better, faster, cheaper, and to greater specification. Now we want to create a company. And so each we says, we only want to create a company. Who wants to invest? Nobody. So in fact, what ends up happening is the government invests in the firm, and in fact takes a 40% equity share because no one else would invest. The other major shareholder was Phillips of the Netherlands. The key point here is that the government's hands were all over this project. One can even make the point, or one can even make the argument that the government made the firm. 
It purchased the technology. It funded the R&D. It made the equity investment, and it created the spin-out firm in the 1980s. The point I'm trying to make here is that this story wouldn't have happened without state leadership. Now let me give you another example. You know, you all know Hyundai now is making pretty decent cars, right? There was a time when Hyundai made the worst cars in the world. And this was one of them. Do any of you remember the Hyundai Pony? Put your hand up if you ever remember the Hyundai Pony. It was probably out of market by the time most of you were aware of cars. Uh, the Hyundai Pony actually was first marketed internationally in the 1980s. Does anyone know what the Hyundai company began its core business in, in the post-war period? It's not cars. Construction. So in the 1960s, Hyundai Construction, it's a conglomerate firm, Hyundai Construction says that it wants to expand and diversify. It says to the government, we want to expand and diversify. We want to move into the auto sector. So you can imagine what investors are thinking. You're in construction. What are you doing moving into the auto sector? But it was a huge firm. It had market share. But there were also huge risks. So one of the first things Hyundai Automotive does is it forms international partnerships. Specifically, it forms a partnership with Ford to learn how to make cars, and it forms a partnership with Mitsubishi to figure out how to make engines. And through these partnerships, then the engineers at Hyundai begin to learn and absorb. It's around this time that the government funds an R&D project in engine innovation. So the government is now funding, not Hyundai. The government is funding the R&D to innovate engine design, to maintain the performance of the Mitsubishi engine, but to make it cheaper. Out of this, then, actually, is a car. It's a crappy car. It's not sold on international markets. In fact, it's only sold in Korea. But you can imagine, right? So now you have Hyundai, it says in the 1960s, we want to go into the car making business. Everybody says you don't know the first thing about cars. So they spend the next 10 years working with the government to <coughs> figure out how to make cars. They finally make a car. They say now we want to sell the car. And you're thinking to yourself, in the 1970s, where do you think most cars in Korea are coming from? Japan. And those cars from Japan are actually pretty good, and they're pretty cheap. So now Hyundai is saying, how are we going to sell our cars in Korea when if you're a rational consumer, you'll just go buy that nicer Japanese car that's also cheaper? So the government protects the market. Actually puts on tariffs on Japanese-made cars. It says now to Japanese automakers, you want to sell your cars inside Korean markets? We're going to make them more expensive. So that Honda that once cost 10,000 will now cost 15,000. And once that Honda costs 15,000, maybe the Korean consumer says, I might take a try on that Hyundai for 10. And that's effectively what happens. The government manipulates the market, taxes Japanese autos, protects its own domestic market, and eventually what we see is the Hyundai Pony selling in Korea. It's not until the 1980s, in fact, that the Hyundai Pony, through continual improvement, actually meets international export standards. And it's not until the 1980s that uh, Hyundai begins to export its cars to American markets. And it was a crappy car by international standards. But as we've seen now, Hyundai actually makes quite half decent cars. And for those of you from Korea or spent time in Korea knows that, in fact, Hyundai has an extremely high-end car uh, manufacturing capability as well that rivals uh, the best car makers from Europe and Japan. The key point of this story is that we oftentimes think of Hyundai as this great corporate success story, but in fact, the founding of Hyundai Automotive was in many ways a function of a government private sector cooperative initiative. 
It was government resources that funded R&D. It was government policy that protected this industry. It was government repression that leveraged labor. And it was government public policy that allowed this firm to leverage existing strengths. And it was government tax breaks that allowed this firm the credit and subsidies that it needed to eventually make this car. The key point I want to make here, just as I did with TSMC in Taiwan, is that these firms had, cre had comparative advantage created for them. They had no business making integrated circuits or cars. But through state leadership and through state policy and through a strategy of picking and making winners, they in fact had comparative advantage created for them. It's this notion that picking and making winners that is at the core of what we call the developmental state. And so now, when we think about the East Asian economic miracle, it's really about the East Asian developmental state. And if we want to really strip it of its even geographical moniker, it's just basically the idea of the developmental state. And just to give you some sense, the idea of the developmental state is extremely appealing globally. Last year, I was in South Africa to give a talk and there was this group of scholars from Botswana, scholars and policymakers, who knew the Taiwanese political economy system inside out. Botswana had studied the Taiwanese model of economic development to try to implement those same institutions and policies and strategies of picking and making winners in Botswana. In fact, in many ways, Botswana's economy is a mirror image of the Taiwanese economy. At the core, of this model is this logic of picking market winners. It's not as though these firms picked things that had no demand. Integrated circuits and semiconductors were in very high demand. Automobiles are in high demand. In other words, these are market winners. These are products and goods that are on global demand in the global economy. The second characteristic is that they made market winners. They not only picked them and said, okay, we're going to move into the IC sector, we're going to move into autos, but they also helped make them through the allocation of public resources, through strategic protection, all the things that I just discussed. And in the end, they created comparative advantage. They created comparative advantage where they did not exist before. So, as I say, I'm in South Africa giving a series of talks and I'm getting schooled by these folks from Botswana on what's going on in Taiwan. And so you leave with this impression that, well look, this is a pretty simple model. Why does it only happen in East Asia? Why do we see the developmental state in East Asia and in very few other places? And why do we see uh, little evidence of what Peter Evans talks about as being a predatory state that we see, for instance, in Zaire? So it's a simple model. I think I probably convinced you, right? I probably convinced you that these sorts of strategic inter interventions can work. And we have the historical evidence to prove that or to demonstrate that. But the fact of the matter is, again, it really is geographically clustered in East Asia. The question then is why? Why East Asia? Part of it is the international context. One has to remember these economies plugged into the global economy when the global economy was growing. They plugged in at the right time. Strangely, they benefited from war. For instance, we know in Korea, there's the Korean War in the early 1950s, there's the Vietnam War, of course Japan is decimated in World War II, and so on. One of the interesting things that happens in the post-war period is the amount of military and economic aid that goes to these economies. The amount of aid that was given to Korea in the 1950s from the United States 
was equal to all of the aid given to the entire African continent and half of the aid given to Latin America. Let me just say that again. Korea received in the 1950s in economic and military aid the same amount as the entire continent of Africa got and half of the Latin America. Because in many ways, the international context in these particular economies reflected American hegemonic interests in the post-war period. This was the Cold War. It was important to the United States that these economies grew. On one level, it was important in terms of American hegemonic interests because they provided important bases for American military. The American military presence in East Asia are in countries such as Japan, Korea, and Singapore. So it was absolutely crucial for American security interests in the region for these economies to grow. It was also important in the Cold War context because in many ways they were the bulwark against communism. Think about all of these countries. Who were their neighbors? Taiwan is right next to communist China. Singapore and Thailand are right next to communist Vietnam. The South Korea just fought a war and created the partition that led to the creation of communist North Korea. So from the American point of view, it was absolutely critical that places like Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, and so on, economically grew. They wanted, in fact, and they needed, in fact, for East Asia to succeed. It's not just the international system, but it's also the developmental state itself. Something about the state, something about the government that allowed them to be de developmental. The first is that within these governments we saw a tremendous bureaucratic hierarchy. These were not democracies. I mean, they were, some of them were institutionally democracies like Japan, but they functioned in a very hierarchical way. Within these bureaucracies, you had an extraordinarily powerful pilot agency that controlled the allocation of resources within the bureaucracy. There was also what we call bureaucratic meritocracy. Unlike in the West, where we oftentimes deride and disparage uh, bureaucrats, bureaucrats in the East Asian developmental states were recruited from amongst the best and the brightest. They were recruited from the top universities. And they recruited only the top students from the top universities. And here's the kicker, they paid them extremely well. These bureaucrats were paid higher than they would be paid in the private sector, which minimized that corruption. So you had very smart and very clean bureaucracies. Thirdly, I said again, they were by and large, with the exception of Japan, authoritarian. So they were not democratic. They did not have to respond to legislatures. They were in many ways autonomous, if you will, from society. Yet they were also very much in bed with and very much closely aligned with business and embedded within the business community. They also had extraordinary leverage or power over business. One of the key characteristics of the developmental state was that they controlled the purse strings. They controlled the money. And it was with this money that they were able to reward and punish firms. They were able to provide credit and subsidies. They were able to reward and punish, reward those firms that were successful and punish those firms that were not. Third, it also has to do with people. These two folks here, uh, Pak Chang Gi from Korea and Chiang Kai shek in Taiwan were not nice people. In fact, they were generals. Well, that doesn't mean they're not nice, but, um, but they were really mean generals, actually. Uh, but they mattered in the developmental state. One might say that they were benevolent dictators. They were extremely brutal. They were brutal. Well, unlike, for instance, Mobutu, who's described in the chapter in Zaire, or unlike Mugabe that we see in Zimbabwe today, they were brutal, but they were committed to growth. They were committed to economic growth in their economies, partly because of security reasons. 
They needed to grow their economy 